come. Welcome and let's get started. Welcome, welcome. Really cool to um, be back again with another live stream. Uh, good to see everybody. So if you are tuning in live, please go ahead to the comments and let me know where you are watching from. And if you can hear my voice and my guitar. And if you're watching a replay, go ahead and comment replay so we know that you guys are catching the replay. We know a lot of folks watch these on, on replay. And if you go to, let me go ahead and put that URL in for you guys. If you go to that worshipguitarshow.com, then you will be able to sign up to get notifications of whenever we go live. And you will also be able to catch all of the replays in one handy place. So go ahead and check out that worshipguitarshow.com. All of the replays will be found over there. Awesome. So today we are going to be talking about guitar tone. And I know that that is a big thing for guitarists, um, no matter what style you play, in order to have a proper tone because it, it affects so many things. So today we're going to be talking about some of the intricacies of guitar tone and just look at some of the various settings that you want to have at your disposal along with some of the effects um, and really use that and have a solid understanding of all of those things so that you can go ahead and cultivate your unique sound in any worship setting. So we'll be talking about some of the basic patches that I have on my board here uh, that I use on a you know, almost daily basis when I play and I've definitely on Sundays as well when playing at church. And then through that whole process, hopefully you'd be able to go ahead and go ahead and craft your own sound. So um, let me get set up here real quick and we'll just make sure that everything is running and working um, fine. Let me just double check this. All right. I'm going to do a quick sound check just with our backing track and with a guitar just to make sure that everything is sounding good. So It looks like we've got good sound going there. Um, got some feedback. Everything is sounding good. And we see that we've got David from uh, tuning in from Eugene, Oregon. Welcome, David. Great to have you. I've never been to that part of the U.S., but I believe it's, uh, it's beautiful over there. And then we've got Darren, one of our repeat viewers, tuning in from, I believe, North Carolina. Good morning, Darren. Great to see you. And then um, Michael Joyce. What's up, guys? Great to see you on the stream here today. So, all right, so we're done through the typical setup and making sure the levels and everything is sounding good. You guys probably see um, we are cranking out some videos again and um, leveling up on our live streams and all of those kind of things. So um, let me just double check one thing over here. We are all good to go. And um, yeah, for you guys watching, you can also say welcome back, Kenan. So Kenan... Um, works here with us at the WGS team, handles all of our video edits and helps me 
get set up in the studio here. Yeah. So uh, that's why everything is sounding and working good. So Kenan just got married. So um, great to have him back again. All right. So as uh, mentioned, we're going to be looking at some tone elements today. And what I've got here on the floor, you won't be able to see it, but I'm going to see if I can share my screen because in that case, you'd be able to follow along with my HX edit uh, because what I've got on the floor is basically my my Helix floorboard. So we recently got a Helix with the aim to build some tones and patches because that's the one question we get so often on our channel is really, you know, how do you um, put together your tone and all those kind of things. So um, what you'll see on the screen right now is I've just changed over to HX Edit. If you can see that, please let me know in the comment section over there. And we might just have to zoom out here a little bit. But basically, this is the tool that I'm using um, to make some edits and tweaks. So whatever we're going to be doing, we can be talking through the different pedals and the different things that we've got here. So for those of you who don't know, the Line 6 Helix, it's been around for a couple of years. And when it comes to kind of all-in-one devices, the Kemper Profiler and the Line 6 Helix, those used to be the two main kids on the block uh, that most folks use, so either a Kemper and a Helix. Now, obviously, today, there's been um, lots of new releases. I know the Axe FX from Fractal Audio has been around for a long time, so um, although that one is not so popular in the worship scene, um, but the let me just go ahead and get out of this section over here. So you did not see the Helix. I will show you that in a second. But those are your two main kind of all-in-one solutions. Now, obviously, before these devices were out, the way to go was to have one tube amp or a lot of folks like two tube amps and then obviously a massive pedal board and a switcher. And, you know, when you look at having to buy at least one good valve amp, let alone two valve amps, all of the nice pedals, and all those kind of things, it, it ends up to being thousands and thousands of dollars that you need to have spent on gear in in um, to get a good tone going. So well, that's one of the things that I love about the Kemper. When I bought my Kemper, which was about five or, or six years ago, what happened there was um, five or six years ago, I bought the Kemper and then... I still have my valve amps because I'm kind of a, so he has a, a Marshall that I've had for over 20 years. And then there's a Fender Blues Junior that I've had for about 15 years. So I've got, you know, had those for a long time. And I also owned Fox AC30s and Mesa Boogies and, and you know, the Marshall JCM 800s and all those kind of amps. But these kind of two valve amps I've kept over all of the years just because of sentimental value. But all of my pedals, I basically sold them. I had the, you know, the Strymon Timeline, the the Big Sky Reverb, a bunch of cool JHS pedals, the Timmy, um, a nice Boss switcher, and basically all the top-of-the-line stuff. And once I got to Kemper, I basically saw, well, I don't actually need this stuff anymore because it's a lot to carry, right? And um, a lot of things to set up. And once I got to Kemper, I no longer needed that. And then, like I said, recently we got the Helix. Now, the reason we got the Helix before I used the Kemper, I was a big Line 6 user. I had the original pod um, when that first came out in, I believe, like early 2000s. And at that point, modeling was like really, um, the it was very new um, that you could actually get a, a device that had digital algorithms that could model a Marshall amp or a Fender amp or a Vox or whatever the case may be. And um, so I've known the Line 6 stuff for a long time. I've had a lot of their pedals over the year, years and... The reason I got the, the Helix is because so many of our viewers were asking, can we help them with tone? And, you know, this is probably the easiest way for us to help our viewers and our members with tones because we can go ahead and set everything up in a way that it's actually usable for them on a Sunday. Now, the big difference between a Kemper and a Helix, for those of you who don't know, a Kemper is a profiler. So that actually profiles another amp. So you physically need to have an amp that you're going to profile and it basically steals the amps sound and it's actually so good that there's been discussions of ethics you know is that actually actually ethical 
that this device can steal an amp like that, uh, the sound of it, and you know that you know the amp has been known for. So that's obviously a discussion for a different day, but um, it's definitely made it super useful. But the thing with the the profiler is you've got guys like Michael Britt and Tone Junkie, HW from Tone Junkie, um, and a, a bunch of other guys. There's also Tone Factor, David Hislip, and the guys that, you know, they've got all the nice amps, and then they profile those amps, and then they sell the patches. And I've bought probably most of the Tone Junkie patches, so a big shout out to them. And if you're using a Kemper, I would highly recommend you check out their stuff. Um, I use it all the time on my Kemper, but if you don't have the amps, you can't then share the profiles because um, obviously the profiles belong to them. I get a single use license and I can use on my Kemper for myself, but I can't give that away. And I don't have the access to all of the amps to profile them to number one, make the, the profiles and then give it away. And so that's why we went to the Helix because that works in a different way. It's not a profile of the amp where you like put a mic in front of the amp and you got a whole system that it basically you know learns that sound the helix works on modeling which is what i mentioned earlier it's like a digital model of these algorithms that can reproduce that sound and because it's a model you just need the machine and then you can say okay cool i want a vox ac30 style amp and i want to put all the effects on and so forth so since we've gotten that We've been able to make some patches and if you want to check them out if you're a helix user you can just go to shop.worshipguitarskills.com i put the link in this youtube video description and you can go ahead and check out some of those um patches that we've made we've made some amp patches we've made some song patches and we are going to keep growing that library over time so that we can more easily share these patches with people who either have the Helix Floor or the Helix LT or even some of the HX Stomp pedals, which is a smaller version of that. And you can still go in and, and use those patches. So that's a little bit of a um, the journey of how we got to the Helix. So what I'm going to do now is let me just play through a couple of um, tones here and just show you what we've got. And we're going to deconstruct some of them and look at some of all of the elements that goes into making the tone. And hopefully that'll be a useful experience for you. And we're going to talk about this in also fundamental principles so that you, whether you have a physical valve amp and pedals that you can go ahead and use all of that stuff in that same fashion as well. Because tone at the end of the day, um, there's some fundamental principles that apply regardless what gear you are using. So we've got Michael saying he transitioned over, he got a Helix and transitioned over from regular pedals. And it's just... Um, there's so much there, but it's a little bit hard to flesh out. He's had it for three years, and he struggles with it all the time. So, yeah, I can totally understand what you're saying with that, Michael, is there's just so many features and so many things in there. And Line 6 have kind of been known for some of their deep editing. I remember back in the day when I had some of the other Line 6 devices, like the Pod Pro, and I also had a Variax guitar and all these kind of things. So you kind of needed to have a software on screen on your computer in order to get to some of the deeper settings and so forth. So it's definitely a different um, beast to deal with, so to speak. Whereas with the Kemper, um, it's German made. So it's it's a totally different engineering mindset. Um, and I'm definitely a fan of that. So you've got more, um, it's more built like an actual amp, right? So my Kemper toaster is right here as well. Um, but in any case, what we wanted to do for that same reason, Michael, is just Make it easy for you to plug and play. So we're going to be releasing some new videos on YouTube to actually show how to put some of these stuff together. But if you just want to spend a couple of dollars and pick up some patches, then we wanted to be able to provide that service and to make it song specific, but also to kind of give you like an overall um, tone that you can use regardless of what you are doing. All right, Mike, I'm saying hey from California. Great to see you, Mike. Welcome, welcome. All right, so... Um, what I've got here is, I'm going to go a little bit close up so you can kind of see what I'm playing there. But I've got four tones I want to talk to you about today. Tone number one is like a clean grit type of tone. Now these, um, and I can mute the, the mic here, let me just play it one more time.
that's kind of that sound. It's the, the clean grit. Um, I'm going to talk about them in a second. My second sound here is more of a drive. <laughs> That's like my second, uh, it's obviously a lot more drive in there. And then I've got something for, that's called hook, or that's more of a bigger sound. That's kind of like a big hook kind of a um, sound. It's not really made to play rock like I've just done because there's too much delay in a modern worship setting. It's obviously a, a much of a wetter sound that you use, but I figured I'll just give you um, run it through its paces. And then I've got a, an ambient sound, which is this. And that's that kind of sound that we obviously used to playing in worship, which is more like a, um, almost acting like a pad. So if I were to go and play a worship set, that's roughly what I would just have handy is these kind of patches. And on my Kemper, I basically have one patch that I use 95% of the time. Uh, it's very overdriven. Um, if I want to clean it up, I either just do a quill tap on my guitar or I just back down the volume of the pickup so that it kind of cleans up a little bit. Um, so uh, Darren is saying that he agrees with Michael. He's had his Helix for seven year, uh, several years, but he haven't even scratched the surface of what it can do. And uh, he's gotten several patches though. <laughs> yeah. Um, no, totally get you with that. And it's, um, it's quite a process to kind of wrap your head around that. Now, um, so we kind of want to make it easy for you guys just to get a patch that you can plug and play. And maybe before we dig into that, um, the best thing that you can do for your tone is to improve your technique. Regardless of what you are playing through, if you can improve your technique, your tone will improve. Whether you are playing through, doesn't matter what you are playing through, as long as it's decent, right? And I always read in guitar magazines where they said, you know, tone is in the fingers. And I could never really understand what they mean. And when I moved to the UK, I lived there for almost five years after I've been a professional musician for, you know, a decade or more, I wanted to go and study further. And I thought that'd be a great way for me to go and meet some people. And it was an awesome experience. And through that, I started writing for Guitar Techniques magazine. I used to go and film the famous guitar players that came to town for whatever gigs they did. And then I would go and film them, do an interview with them. And then I would transcribe everything that they played and write a lesson about that. And that got published into the magazine. So through that, I got to meet awesome people. Um, Buddy Whittington, Joe Bonamassa, Joe Satriani, Eric Sardinas, Billy Sheehan, Tony McAlpine, Julian Large. Um, the list kind of goes on with all these amazing guitar players that I had the privilege to sit down and talk tone, talk technique, talk life and talk music and then basically learn from these guys and go and make a lesson out of that. But long story short, one day I got an email from the guys at, at um, Guitar Techniques Magazine, and they said to me, um, Satriani is in town. Can I go and do uh, film him, do the interview, do the lesson? And I thought, wow, this is amazing. Of course I can do that. He was one of my childhood guitar heroes. 
I've always loved his sense of melody that Satriani has. Um, so he was really, a, I'm a big fan of him. But they said to me, the only issue is um, Joe will not have his gear with him. Sometimes we actually did the interview at the venue on stage. Um, but obviously in Joe's case, he would. He, I think he played a, a massive venue there. So um, we had to do it at the hotel. So, um, and they asked me, can you please take an amp with you? So that an amp and some pedals. So Joe can just plug in and do the interviews through your amp and pedals. He'll have his own Ibanez guitar. So I said, yeah, sure, we'll do it. And then um, I didn't have an amp and I didn't have any pedals that would have suited that use for Joe. And then a friend of mine, Jay Kalpin, um, he said, uh, I asked him, you know, if I can borrow some of his stuff. And I think he even joined us, him and a mate of mine, Gavin. So we went to the hotel like a fancy hotel in Hyde Park and they actually had the whole floor booked off uh, just for Joe and um, obviously you know he's quite famous and a big deal over there um, so we got escorted up to the floor with security and then they took us into this kind of reception room they had some nice foods that we could eat and everything was set up um, for the interview so we quickly you know set up the amp the pedals and the filming gear and everything now, here's the only thing is I was a little bit nervous because the amp that we had, um, I don't even know what the make was, but it was like a very boutique style amp. Um, it was a very bluesy amp, similar to this Blues Junior, but it had like its own drive channel, um, uh, but it was like a custom made amp, boutique bluesy amp. And then the pedals we had, none of it was high gain. And obviously Satriani is known for his high gain playing. Um, and I was just a little bit concerned, well, is Joe actually going to be happy with the amp and the pedals and all those kind of things? And turned out he was totally fine. He didn't have any issues. He was a really, really nice guy. But the moment he picked up his guitar, now remember, I've been listening to, at the time, I guess I was th uh, 30 years old, 30 or something like that. And I started playing guitar when I was about 16. And um, so I guess I probably started listening to Satriani when I was around 18. So I've listened to him for over 12 years. So I kind of knew his playing and his sound and all those kind of things. And he picked up his guitar and he plugged into to gear that wasn't his. He just had his guitar. But instantly with that first note, I could hear, wow, that's Satriani tone. And then that was the moment that I realized it's not about having the right amp or having the fancy pedals. You've got to trust your tone and your technique because then when you strike the strings you're going to play with confidence and it's going to sound good and maybe the best way that i can um kind of uh illustrate this imagine you have to stand in on a stage in front of ten thousand people and you have to give a speech about something you have no idea about um chances are most of us would probably not be very confident and vocal and like really project what we're going to say because it's like wow i don't know what i'm talking about i don't know who these people are the lights are blinding me. It's a very intimidating situation. So the way that you're going to talk is not going to exude confidence. It's not going to command attention, all those kind of things. But if you're with your friends and you're kind of just shooting the breeze and you got something that you're really excited about, you're going to be talking in a much different way. There's going to be different energy and presence in the way that you talk. And the same happens when you play guitar. When you have confidence in your technique, you're really going to dig in and you're not going to be afraid to play. So that is the, the main tip I want to give you guys today. And we'll be covering some of the string muting techniques in future videos because that's very important. When you have a dirty tone with your old rig, but you're playing on a Sunday and you're playing worship, so you don't really want to be out of place. So a lot of people kind of have that timid situation where, you know, you're on stage, you've got to talk to 10,000 people about something you don't know um, what you've got to talk about. That same approach applies when you're then approaching your playing with timidity then it's not going to sound good. So um, the Bible talks, I think it was in, in Timothy where it says, God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of love, power, and a sound mind. And it was basically just encouraging all those kind of things. So when you can play with courage and with power and with a sound mind and with that conviction, your tone is going to sound totally different. And the way you get there is to improve your technique. So that's kind of my disclaimer, right? So you don't have to uh, worry about having the right gear, but just work on your technique and you're going to be 80% there. Now, having said that, once your technique is in place, let me go ahead and pull up my, um, I'll pull up the Helix in, in, in a minute. But this is my clean sound.
it's obviously there's some grit on it, right? So it's clean-ish, but it's got some grit on it. And in worship, that's that kind of edge of breakup sound that you want. You want the amp to be on an edge of breakup so that your sound has got some grit to it and, and it can cut through the mix easier. So what I'm going to do here, let's go back to the Helix. So what you can see right now, um, let me just see if I can add something else in here. Um, don't worry about it. What you see in front of you now is the amp and you can see there that I'm on, this is called the clean grit. Okay. And now I can go into, into the, the stomp, well, the, the snapshot mode. And that basically means I now have all of these pedals that you see in front of the screen right now. Let me just move this one thing out of my way so I can, hopefully you can see my mouse. Let me see if I go to HX edit. Hopefully you can see my mouse as I'm moving around. So what's happening now is I've got some pedals that I'm using over my sound. And there's a compression, which is that dynamic thing you're seeing over there. So if I turn that, if I click on that compression, I just got an issue with a window here that doesn't wanna get away. So let me just move that nice and small over there. Hopefully that stays, okay, cool. So this compression, I can turn this off and then as I'm playing now, you're gonna see that there's a little line through the compression. If I turn it back on, everything lights up. So now if it looks like this, with no compression, the sound doesn't sound as tight. But when I add in my compression, listen to the difference. The sound is a lot tighter. It kind of makes your soft notes louder and your loud notes softer. So these are the kind of settings that I've got um, with my compression. And this threshold, that basically means up at what point is that compression going to kick in. So if the threshold is like super low, let's do it like that. And let's play here. Uh, you can kind of hear the, the tone lost its punch. But if I bring it back up to roughly where it was, listen to this. And even up a bit more. That obviously makes a big difference. And then the ratio is how hard should that compression kick in. And then the attack and the re release means how quick does it, does the attack kick in. So right now the attack is at 5 and 97 milliseconds. No, it's actually, sorry, I, I was on uh, about 38 milliseconds. If I move that all the way down to 509 milliseconds, you can almost not hear it because the attack takes too long. But if I take it back to roughly where it was, then the attack is going to kick in sooner. And the release means how long does it, once it's attacked, how long does it actually keep that compression going? The mix is simply how much of the compression you are gonna hear. So if I take this mix right now, it's at 74% and I turn it all the way down. So now we're just gonna hear 1% compression and mostly just a clean sound. If I put it back up to roughly 74%, where it was, then you can kind of hear that compression kicking in. The level is simply how loud that compression is going to be and the knee has got to do with um, kind of the shape of that compression. But in any case, that's the first thing that you want to have on your, on your pedal board because if that compression is off, like it's off now, versus on, you can see that compression just basically squeezes the sound and kind of gives you a bit more life. Now I've got, this is my clean sound. So I've got a, what's known here as a Timmy, and it's like a, based on, on um, a thing called, the pedal called the Timmy. So it kind of adds a bit of grit to this. Without it, with it. I 
I've also got a boost if I wanted to boost the sound. That's my second pedal here. So sometimes you're playing and you feel, well, if only I had a little bit more boost without changing my volume, because then this boost is almost driving the amp harder. So, so the boost together with that Timmy, now the distortion is on and the boost. What I'm gonna do, let me jam to the track real quick. And I'm gonna turn off my um, compression, my distortion and my boost. All of these are turned off now. Listen to this, it's not gonna be a great sound, but as I add in the compression, the tone, um, and then the Timmy and the boost, it's gonna make a big difference. So listen to this. Turn on the compression. Turn on the drive. Turn on the boost. and I added the, for a bit of fun I added the pog in the end here which is what you see and um, listen to the sound without the pog so there's with the pog So it's kind of giving me an octave above what I'm playing. So that's how I like to have my um, tones set up so that it's possible for me to basically have the ability to add stuff to what I'm playing. So I kind of want to have a nice, um, a nice starting point, but then from there I want to be able to, I always have my compression on so that the sound is nicely squeezed, not too heavily, but it's a nice tight focus sound. And then I always, almost always have uh, my, my tone on the edge of breakup so that it can kind of cut through the mix. And then I want to be able to add in another distortion, like we call it a second um, gain stage. So it's a second pedal there that's adding some additional distortion. I love having a boost in order to drive the amp a little bit louder. And then the pog was able to kind of give me that fun that we were able to have there in, in a little bit. So um yeah so hopefully that's useful the other kind of things that i have on this thing is like a retro reel which is like a uni vibe type of thing listen to this you can kind of hear that modulation without it with it So it adds some movement to my tone, which is really nice. Sometimes you want that for like a... And also a chorus.
So it's a, for a bit of a, um, movement. So now we've covered the basic sound. We've spoken about the compression, adding some drive, adding a boost, adding the pog, which is the, um, a poly octave generator, where the, the term comes from, adding an additional octave to my sound. Then we had kind of a, a, a vibe, uni vibe, and a chorus. So I'll go ahead and then talk about the the verb and the delay in a second, but let's answer a few questions here real quick before we get to that. So Mike is saying, I love listening to your tones. Thanks, Mike. And he says, I've noticed though that you tend to have much more overdriven tones than many other guitarists. Is that just your ears or do I prefer more drive? And if so, why is that? Yeah, great observation, Mike. Um, my tone is definitely more overdriven than the standard worship. Um, tone that you're typically used to um, hearing and it's for two reasons um, number one that's just my preference and I believe um, you know God has made us all unique in the sense that he's placed something in our hearts and in our lives and he's given us a certain uh, set of experiences and people around us and we're all just unique in, in, in so many things how we've gr grown up the, our, our preferences, our tastes, our mission, our vision, what we're doing. And, and, and I want to celebrate that kind of thing. So that's why I think it's important for your tone to be a reflection of your personality in a way, right? So I'm not saying that you need to, you can arrive at church with, um, you know, a tone that's not going to serve the song. So there is a part of it that we have to at least do something that's going to work in that setting. Like if I went to church with you know, two 4x12 marshals cranked, that's not going to work for that setting. So I have to go there to be of service, to see, okay, cool, what is required of me as my role as a guitar player. But at the same time, I shouldn't be a copycat. You know, they say uh, most, well, all people are born originals, but most people die copycats. So I think it's, in, it's important for you to kind of find your flavor. And my flavor just happens to be a little bit more drive. Um, so that's what I like. I've kind of grown up listening to a lot of blues and rock so obviously some of my tastes were formed there i know a lot of players kind of cite the cold play guitar tone uh, for what they like and for me that is a really lovely tone great tone but it's just um that is not quite my vibe so i just like drive and i like to have i like what it, what you're able to do with that i do clean it up with my um when i play on, on sunday with my um volume control but yeah, so my preference is just drive, and I, I think if you use it the right way, it adds like a lovely, um, it adds a different flavor to church music. And without getting into those kind of details is, if you read the Psalms, right, of King David, and God said David is a man after his own heart. And if you read those Psalms, David was like, he was a vulnerable guy and he and and some of the psalms he was just really you know down and out and, and he was able to communicate that and be real and be authentic with god and i think god liked that the fact that he didn't try to be pious or pretend or whatever like maybe the pharisees back in the day might have done and he was just real and that raw emotion that's what i'm trying to say kind of came through and i think that when when church music that's a bigger discussion for another day but we don't want to have it to be too sanitized because then if there's not some of those raw elements present in music, whether it's the tones, whether it's the way that we create tension and resolve it, whether it is the emotion behind it, whatever, I'm not saying you want to go dark emo, definitely not, but it needs to have a realness and authenticity and a rawness. And that's what I like about the drive. So a um, little bit of a long-winded answer for you there. I just like to be able to add some of that unsanitized, tones in worship and if just the fact that it's not unsanitized doesn't mean that it's um, unholy like some people might think a lot of distortion is unholy that's not the case but it is for me um, it just adds that vibe and then I think when people hear that in the right way when the music is is honest and and, and it's got some of that rawness and authenticity I think people can relate to it whereas if it's too sanitized and too clean and too perfect then it becomes like pop music that is so well produced and organized that it doesn't really touch the soul and i think we need to find a way to touch the soul with music because that pulls people into the worship encounter where they can really encounter god so that's that's my answer for um for for that one 
Uh, thanks for the, for that comment. Um, all right. The next com- question here. Um, well, Bliss Road said he's got to watch and uh, he's got to run to watch the rest on replay. Um, awesome. Thanks for tuning in and enjoy the replay. Um, Jess is saying life changing to begin with tones. And thanks for sharing the story. Yeah, the turn in the fingers thing, so good. Uh, Warwick saying, hey, from England. Hey, Warwick. All right, so the one more question here before we carry on with some of the rest of the tones. Jez is saying, do you follow any formula in dialing the volume from the base drive to boost? How do you measure the right amount of boost? You may need to consider um, the right amount of boost you may need considering your stacking drives, the compression gains. Yeah, that's a great observation. When you're adding a bunch of these pedals together, um, you are affecting the sound with each thing. And it's like if you're making too many photocopies of a photocopy, at some point you lose the original vibe there. So you want to use these things like spices when you're cooking. If you use too little salt, the food is bland. If you use too much salt, um, it's too salty and and you're not going to enjoy it. So you kind of want to get that ratio right. So for me, I kind of go by feel. I don't want the the, the the guitar sound to start sounding like it fizzles or like it's um, too fuzzy or too... I don't want to lose the clarity. So that's why with a tone like this, I'll just show you one more time. Um, switch these on. So you can still hear my clean sound. So I like to retain the clarity because if you look at, uh, for many times or for many years, the Metallica scooped sound was kind of um, well known, especially what they use on the Black Album, for example, is that V sound where you cut out all the mids, boost the bass, boost the treble, and you get a very scooped sound. But it's those mid-range frequencies that really cut through the mix and that brings some of that tone that you kind of want to have present in a worship set. So I just make sure that I don't lose the original vibe of my tone and rather have these things to enhance rather than just totally take over so for me it's kind of a um um yeah it's just a preference thing and if you have a sound guy that you can trust um someone who can give you good feedback you can ask him what does it sound like in the mix do you think uh, the delay is too much too little is the drive too much too little is it clear is it full um all those kind of things so that's the way I go about that. And uh, Jethro is saying he recently got a PRS SE2408. What are my thoughts on it? I don't actually know that particular um, that particular PRS, but I'm a massive PRS fan. This one I've had for, um, wow, I bought it secondhand and I've had it for over, is it 20 or 30 years? 20 years. Um, so this is like my main guitar. I've got a few other fairly nice guitars that I just never played because this one is so good. Um, so I'm a big fan of PRS. Uh, I love their stuff. And um, so, yeah, I've not played that particular model, but it sounds, uh, congrats on that new guitar. Uh, he says he's got that guitar. And what, what are my thoughts on Quill Split Tone? I like that. The um, the Strat, like, over here is like... Um, without a Quill tap. And then if I tap my Quill... Or maybe go to the neck. So I like that kind of sound to clean it up sometimes. I want some of that. If I want to kind of go dirty again, then I just put my quill tap back in. And for those of you not familiar with the term, this is a humbucking pickup. So it's more high gain pickups. And when you do a quill tap, it becomes an acts more like a single quill, like you would find in the more vintage Strat type of sound. Um, so yeah, I like it. I don't use it that often, but I definitely... That's the other thing we didn't talk about here. There's only so much time that we have um, to talk about tone, but um, 
We've got a detailed training and a course about that. If you want to check it out, there's a link to our course store in the description. We've got a tone course where we go into all this. But you want to also know your guitar and you want to um, you want to know what pickup to use when. Like if I use my bridge pickup with this tone. Versus my neck. Neck. Bridge, middle, neck quill tap, bridge quill tap. So you can see already there's so many tones on offer just knowing your pickups and also where you strike the strings and how hard you strike them. All those things play a massive role in your tone. So I would definitely um experiment with that know it know your gear know thyself and know thy gear i guess is a good way to go with um warwick is saying um my sound is much more overdriven that you get away with with the band setup that he does at church um yeah so that's um obviously it's all band dependent as well and the, the main thing that i might say there is um it's important for us as guitar players to realize that wherever we are, we got to serve the moment, right? And and whatever the function is, because we are there to serve. Ultimately, we are there to serve and um, to help. So if that tone is not going to work for that style of music or for the, you know, whatever the case may be, then it's totally cool for you to um, adapt your tone to the situation. And if I were hired, and I used to be a hired gun um, toward the world, um, I had the privilege to play with some Grammy Award winning artists and we played in the Royal Albert Hall in London and toured and that stuff was all fun and when whoever I played with I kind of had to serve their song and their music and so forth um, so the main thing that I would say is just do what's required of the moment and number two see how you can be expressive within that role so that you don't have to be a copycat and that's kind of why we teach our members not just to learn songs note for note. Like if you're going to play Lion and the Lamb by Leland, um, the, you probably should play that intro as it's played because that's the song. That's what people might expect to hear. Uh, but then for the rest of the thing, you don't have to mimic the rest of the stuff note for note. You, um, There's, I believe, um, Adam, when, when they sinned and they ate the apple, they obviously went and they hid because they realized you know that they've sinned and and we all know the story and and god spoke this word in um hebrew ayeka and it basically means adam where are you right and a friend of mine um told me the story and then i realized but god is might be saying that to all of us is like where are you so that we can not be a copycat of somebody else but that we can find what makes you you and then release that sound and that's why part of our ethos yeah at virtual guitar skills is you want to develop your skills you want to unlock your style and then you want to unleash your sound because then i think that that is really unique to you so whatever works for you in in that regard is great and and i do realize that um yeah my tone is very very um distorted but then also in the way that i play I play a lot more single note stuff. So I wouldn't be playing these kind of kind of fat chords at a church. You know, I mostly do these kind of two voicing stuff. Let me show you that same track again. Um, So while my tone is very dirty, um, I use it, they say with great power comes great responsibility and with a dirty tone like that, you've got to use it responsibly, right? You can't just go and play massive palm muted power chords and you know double string bends and all that kind of stuff. It's going to be out of place. But in the way that I played it now, that's kind of how I play at church, more of a melodic approach. Um, 
and therefore a dirty tone in that sense works. But totally, like I said, everyone's got their own preferences and also functions that you've got to perform. So, you know, by all means, you know, experiment with that. So thanks for, for that feedback. Warwick, awesome. Um, and then um, a lot of you saying the, the split sounding awesome and loving the, the creamy blues tone. Yeah, so guys, whenever I switch this mic on and we do these live streams, time just goes by so quickly and we have the same when we have our weekly Q&As with our members. Um, we just get started and then the hour is over. But before we lock off today, um, we're going to be doing more videos on our YouTube channel about tone. Let me just quickly talk to you about, um, I've now spoken about compression to squeeze that sound to make sure it's nice and tight and even. We added drive. We, we started with a edge of breakup. So then we added drive and then we could add a boost. And then we also add the pog that we could add there for that octave higher. And then obviously the, 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 the vibe in the chorus. So those were the two of the um, or different effects and so forth. The other two things that you have at your display is delay. So in this case, that's not a lot of delay. Well, that <laughs> delay is relative, right? But if I add in this delay, now the delay carries on forever, right? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to play once more with like not a lot of delay and then I'm going to add in I'm going to add in my lots of delay and listen to the difference. So just normal delay. delay Obviously, um, that was probably too much delay, but if you play it in the right way, then you you start using the delay as part of your, your playing. So I like to have my tones like that, one where I just have like, either I can play with no delay at all, and just reverb, or a little bit of delay, or an abundance of delay. Because then you can play some really cool stuff. And then I have the same with my reverb. So right now I've got like a decent amount of reverb. And yeah, I've got a lot more. Not so much. A lot. So yeah, if I'm gonna do a sound like this, for example, I can get really creative and I can go. this was on the same patch so I can just throw in my spices and I can kind of adapt my sound so all of that was just my clean grit sound and I didn't really get to the real overdriven one but it's pretty much the same concept so you just want to have variety and be able to bring these things in as you are playing if you know, wow I just need a little more delay I need a little bit more reverb or I need less delay less reverb or I want a little bit more drive a bit more volume 
I want to have some movement on my sound. I want to add that octave with the, the pog. So when you have that ability at, at the tap of a button, then you can be creative about it. And if you think about a cook, you know, the way that they use spices is really um, just um, creative use. So hopefully this has been useful for you guys. If you want to check out any of our patches, I put the link in the description of this YouTube video. If you want to check out any of our courses, including the Tone course, also a link in the description for you to check any of those out. And if you have any questions, you guys can always email me. Let's see if I can put the email on here. Um, I don't have it right here, but it's support at worshipguitarskills.com. We'd love to hear from you guys. And um, we are going to be more active in our Facebook group where we can also have discussions. So you can search for Worship Guitar Skills, the group on Facebook. And we're going to be doing weekly posts and discussions and just a lot of good stuff, obviously on Facebook and YouTube as well. So um, a few quick questions. Um, let's just have a look here real cool, quick. Um, yeah, so Mike is saying a personal question, what really gets me inspired? You know what, the thing that inspires me um, is connection, right? And that's really what worship is about. It's an encounter with God and us connecting with our Lord and Savior and our Creator and and just being able to express our immense gratitude for you know what Jesus accomplished for us on the cross and being able to connect with God, to connect with, with people, those things inspire me. And one of the things that you can connect with people is through story. And that's, if you have some of your favorite movies, you didn't like the movie because the color grading was awesome or because they had some really cool special effects. You're going to love the movie because of the story. And in music, we are telling stories in how we create tension and resolution, how we create a tense sound and we resolve it. And then how we use tone and notes and all those kind of things. So I love that being able to express yourself through music and through that, create an environment where people can connect with God, you can connect with God, you're expressing yourself. And at the same time, um, yeah, to use stories and to, to play cool melodies and, and cool things on the instrument that uh, the Bible talks when Saul was tormented by the evil spirit, they said, find us a guy who's skillful on the harp. So and then when David came and played skillfully on the harp, he changed the atmosphere and Saul was able to chill and calm down and the evil spirit would leave. So those kind of things inspire me when we can use what we are passionate about as guitar players and use that to um, um, yeah, just release a heavenly sound, I would say. And, and, and um, so that's inspiring to me. And then whatever ways we can get to do that is awesome. Um, Jetro is asking, how much is too much reverb? I think when you lose the, the essence of your tone and when it becomes washy and you can't hear that clarity about it, and it's kind of sounds like you, you know, yeah, it's just, that's, that's going to be too much. And you just enough reverb is where the sound starts to sound a bit majestic a little bit and not so much too dry. So again, it's going to be a preference thing, but um, I'll, I'll go ahead and, and do some more videos around that. But again, you don't want to lose the original essence of this of the sound. And the Darren was saying it's got a lot to do with discipline and, and dynamics. Yeah, so true. Discipline and dynamics goes a long way with your tone and what you play. One thing I'm guilty of, and I need to work on that, is overplaying. And that's where the discipline and the restraint also comes in. And uh, it's definitely a guitarist thing. So, um, Darren's saying we have to remember that we are there to serve and glorify God in our playing. I can't agree more. 100%. That's our role and function. So, um, and it's amazing that we get to serve and still be creative and expressive in how we do that. So, that, that's really cool. Um, thank you, Warwick. That's really awesome to hear. And um, Michael saying, looking forward to the future. Uh, we're going to be doing more tone videos, definitely. So thanks for that. Uh, Jez, thank you for showing up. And um, yeah, so he says it depends on the area of sanctuary. Some has natural reverb. So that's one thing to consider. Yeah, totally. If you're playing in a big building, um, you probably don't want to have too much reverb where if it's a smaller building. So you have to kind of adapt those things as well. And yeah. Um, Edward is saying it's got one multi-effect pedal, so it can really only switch one effect on and off during a set. Uh, what's your take on what effect should should be? Well, in that case, um, Edward, what you can do 
if you not don't have the ability to switch all those things on, then you can kind of get like a, a meat and potatoes tone that will have compression, delay, reverb, drive. And you can get a, a long, a lot, f far a lot with those kind of things. And then when you need, you can maybe save that same sound into a different patch where you've added, say, chorus or, or, or something else when you want to change the sound. But for the most part, I stick to one sound and I just tap my reverbs to be in time. And that's basically the, the, the kind of way that I go with that. Well, guys, thank you so much. Like I said, time always flies. I hope you got value out of this. If you have any questions, uh, leave them for us even in the comment section of this um, video. Um, I, I will read and reply to those. And then um, I'll look forward to seeing you on our next live stream. If you want to get notifications for when we go live, you can sign up at thatworshipguitarshow.com. And I'll put the URL on the screen for you guys. Um, then you'll get notifications of whenever we go live. We send out a weekly newsletter linking to great content. And... Um, yeah, hope you guys are doing great. Have a wonderful rest of your day. For those um, in the US, I believe your day just started. We're kind of in the end of our day. So um, be, be really cool. Um, have a great one. And Brian says he just purchased Riding Worship Parts module. Can't wait to dive into it. Awesome. Thanks for your support there. Happy to um, support you in any other way there. If you have any questions, Brian, just reach out. And um, really cool uh, to, to hear that. So guys, thank you so much for showing up. Much love. Uh, be um, Have a great one. And um, I look forward to seeing the rest of the videos, our next live streams, and um, anywhere else that we get to connect online. Have a great one. Chat soon. And all the best. Bye-bye.